God's grace is about more than just eternal life. I mean, eternal life is great, don't get me wrong. But God wants that new life to begin for you now, today, here. God has a new life ready for you. Hi, I'm Bernie Diamond. Welcome again to Christianity Works as we head into this final message in the series called Extravagant Grace. He, God is a God of extravagant grace. And over the last few weeks, we've talked deliberately about a subject that is not particularly popular. You know, when I produce programs about relationships and dealing with difficult people and, and managing your money and, and, and all that sort of stuff, they're incredibly popular programs. People stream to them on the internet and we get a lot of response from television and radio and so on. But when you start talking about sin, when you start talking about the central malady of the human condition, a malady that God took so seriously that he sent Jesus, his son, to die on that cross for you and me, people kind of don't want to hear about that. Oh, don't talk about my sin. No, look, I'm not, not a bad person, really. And yet, all along, that sin robs us of the life that Jesus came to buy for us. Jesus didn't just come to die on the cross so that we could be forgiven, although that's one of the most important things that he did. Jesus also rose again to give you and me a new life, a resurrection life, a born-again life, a life where the slate's wiped clean and we can start again. And as long as we allow sin to fester away in our lives, as long as we deny that sin, as long as we make excuses, as long as we disassociate the symptoms from the cause, we're not going to lay hold of that abundant life. We're, we're not going to experience that extravagant grace of God in our lives. Look, we all have to deal with sin in our lives. And, and my prayer is that hopefully we've spent this time over these last few weeks, you've been convicted of whatever that one sin is in your life that's holding you back, to take that to God, to own that, to, to say, God, I know that my anger, or I know that my emotional insecurity, or whatever it is, I know that this one thing is robbing me of the amazing, abundant life that you have for me. Father God, forgive me. And, and my prayer is that you've put all your eggs in one basket, that you've Put all your faith, all your trust in this Jesus who died for you so that your sins would be forgiven, so that the requirements of God's love and God's justice could both be met as Jesus paid the terrible price for your sin and for my sin on that cross. My prayer is that as you put all your trust and all your hope in this Jesus, you're experiencing the forgiveness that you now have the right standing that you now have before God through Jesus Christ. People sometimes criticize me for, for talking about this stuff. But you see, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power for salvation, the power to a transformed life. The reason we're talking about this stuff here at the beginning of the year is so that you will be leading a transformed life in this new year. God has such an awesome plan for you. He's given you gifts and abilities that none of the rest of us have. You realize that? You've been exquisitely handcrafted by God. He has a purpose for your life, no matter how young or old, rich or poor, black or white. You are loved of God. Loved beyond any words. And this God of yours who sent Jesus to die and rise again for you, he has the most amazing plan for your life. 
And perhaps you believe, you believe in Jesus, you believe that he came for you, you believe that you have this new life, and yet you still struggle. You believe, but you struggle with unbelief. You, you believe, but you, you struggle with sin. Let me bring you to Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Let's just, let's just get into God's word. God has such powerful things to say, powerful things that can transform our lives, much more powerful than anything I can ever say. Let's dive into God's word. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Therefore, since we are justified, what does that mean? Well, as we saw over the last couple of weeks on the program, to be justified means to have a right standing with God. We are justified by faith in Jesus. We believe that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on that cross. He took my sin and your sin on his shoulders. And he suffered and died and paid the price of our sin so that we could have a right standing with God. Just as a prisoner who's served his term steps outside that prison gate, he now has a right standing in the eyes of society and the law because the price has been paid for his crime. And so Jesus paid the price for your crime and mine, your sin and mine. And as a result, we now are justified. We stand before God as pure and white, as clean, as holy as Jesus himself. We have a right standing. Why? Because Jesus paid the price and we put our trust in that. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are no longer at war with God. We've turned back. We've believed in Jesus. We now have peace with God. When you sit down on that comfortable chair in the morning and you spend a bit of time with God, you're at peace with God because you have a right standing with God. And we've obtained access to that through the grace in which we now stand. And so we can boast of the hope of God's glory. See, that's the good news. Yeah, we stumble sometimes. Go to God and ask for forgiveness. Believe that Jesus paid the price and you forever will have a right standing. Now, last week we finished off on the program talking about the struggle that we all have with sin. Yes, we believe. Yes, we've taken the step. Yes, we want to live our lives for God. Yes, we want to live that new, abundant, born-again life that Jesus spoke about. And we're all still tempted. We, we all still find that we have parts of ourselves warring against that desire. And, and we spend time with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 14 and, and following verses, where Paul says, hey, I have exactly the same problem. I find it to be a law that whenever I want to do what's right, I find that sin lies close at hand. I don't end up doing the things I want to do. I, I end up doing the things I don't want to do. Who will save me from this wretched body of sin and death? Thanks be to God, our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to pick up at this point, because that's a problem that we all have. I want to pick up now and talk about how we actually live out this new life. Given that we have the problem of temptation, given that we have the problem of old sins raising their ugly heads and still trying to drag us off, given all of that, how do you actually lay hold of the grace of God? How do you actually live a holy life? How do you actually live in the resurrection power that God has for you? Well, to discover that, we're going to roll on to Romans chapter 8. Join me now. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, even though we still struggle with sin. And God knows that. God's a realist. God knows that sanctification, or as I like to call it, our rehabilitation from the old self to the new self, takes time. God gets that. Should we go on deliberately sinning? No. Paul said, don't do that. And rightly so. But when we do stumble, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So Paul's saying here, look, just look at the Old Testament. The law doesn't work. The, the law doesn't get us into a right standing with God because the law is weakened by our own flesh. We can't keep the law. We can't keep the rules. 
Those 613 commandments and prohibitions in the Old Testament, we haven't got a hope in hell, I use that word deliberately, of keeping those. So God's come along and done something that the law weakened by the flesh couldn't do. Rules never changed anybody's life. Rules never helped us to live a better life. Instead, he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. As we've seen over these last few weeks, Jesus paid the price. He's met the requirements of the law. And so now it's time for us not just to believe in that. Yes, we should believe in that. We should believe that we are saved and forgiven through Jesus and what he did on that cross. It's not, not just about believing it, it's about living in it. For those of us who walk not according to the sinful flesh, but according to the Spirit. The big question though is, how do you walk in the Spirit? Let me just give you this scripture, and then we'll take a short break and come back and, and have a look at it. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on spirit is life and peace. Paul's talking to him here about a change of mind, a change of what we think about. You've got sin and you've got God, the Holy Spirit in you. Which one are you going to focus on? It's like you've got sin, the Holy Spirit, you've got this big black dog. You've got this tiny, small, white dog. Which one's going to grow up to be stronger? The answer is the one that you feed. And that's what it means to set our mind on the things of the spirit, not the things of the flesh. What we need is a change of thinking. As, as Christians, we often underestimate the power of our minds. God has given you a mind. God has given you a mind, will, and emotions. And here, He's talking about how you use your mind during your day. What do you think most about? The things of God. The, the things that God wants you to do. The Holy Spirit. All the things of this earth. The things of the flesh. Your own natural desires. The one that will win is the one that you feed. We'll be back after this short break. I'd just like to take this short break to remind you that you can have instant access to the fresh daily devotional, a powerful scripture verse, and some words of inspiration, hope, and encouragement to help you live in the victory, in the righteousness, in the right standing that God purchased for you on that cross. Isn't God's word powerful? It, it changes everything when we understand what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. You can receive the fresh e-devotional by stopping by at our website, christianityworks.com, and you will see that fresh devotional sign up right there at the top of the homepage. Just click on it, pop in your name and your email, and that devotional will be winging its way to your inbox every morning to help you become a man or a woman of God's word, to help you be all that God made you to be. May God bless you as you receive his word. Look, this, this struggle between the things of the Spirit and the things of the flesh is, is one that we all face. Let's just continue to read for a little bit. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though your body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Listen, God just doesn't do the whole cross thing and cause you to be forgiven and then leave you on your own. God sends his Holy Spirit to dwell in you. The moment you believe in Jesus, you receive the spirit of God. Your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you. You are not on your own in this. We all have struggles with sin and temptation. We all do. Don't ever think that because I'm the guy on television, I'm not tempted. 
course I'm tempted. Sometimes my anger will raise its ugly head. I don't want it to, but sometimes it will. And yet the more we focus on the things of God, the more time we spend in his word, the more we desire to do for him, the more we find ourselves walking in the spirit. As, as one preacher said, where the mind goes, the man follows. Your mind is a powerful asset. It's also powerful for bad reasons. You can use your mind for good or for bad. What do you focus your thought life on? What do you focus your thinking on? You are not alone. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Rely on Him. Open God's Word. Pray. Be a man or woman of God's Word. Let the Spirit take the Word of God and write it on your heart. Hey, that's what we're doing here together right now. I'm believing that after our time together today, you are going to have a strength and a power and a reliance on the Holy Spirit that you didn't have before we got together because God's Word never returns to Him void. God's Word always accomplishes that which He set it out to accomplish. Look, there is always going to be a struggle in your body, in your mind, in your heart between the things of the flesh and the things of the Spirit, between chasing after what you want and honouring God. But in any noble pursuit in life, whether it's getting a university degree, whether it's, it's becoming an elite athlete, whether it's learning to play the piano, there is always a struggle between doing what I want now to gratify my desires and sacrificing that and doing what I know to be right for future glory. The elite athlete, they train for hours. They sacrifice so much. Their diet, their, their relationships, their friendships, their social life. They sacrifice everything to win that gold medal. And, and it's the same with us. We are called to sacrifice everything. When, when God says, lay this down, friend, we are called to lay it down. I love here Paul's account of Abraham's step of faith. We looked at it briefly the other week, but, but let's go back to it now. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. See, hoping against hope, he believed he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Friend, you see your sin before you. You see the mistakes that you make before you. And look, when you read Abraham's story back in the book of Genesis, he made plenty of mistakes along the way. Don't worry about that. But his faith never wavered. He, he stuck with the promises of God. God promised him a child when he was 75, and that happened when he was over 100 years old. That's impossible. But God is the God of the impossible. As you struggle through your life, and things aren't perfect in your life. And they never are. They're not perfect in my life. They're not perfect in your life either. And you see all these perfections and you see all these reasons why God prom God's promises shouldn't come true. And you, you see your own sin which mars your life and you think, will God forgive me again? Don't let your faith in Jesus Christ waver. Because it's your faith that will be accounted to you as righteousness. Just keep on trusting in God. God has said, if you believe in my son, you are forgiven. Trust that promise. God has said, if you accept my son, I will put my Holy Spirit in you. You are not alone. You have my power. Trust that promise. God has said that all things in your life work together for good. Trust that promise. In fact, let's go to that promise now. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. See, God had a plan. God knew that he was going to draw you unto himself before time began, before you were even created. He's predestined you to be with him. He's justified you through Jesus Christ. Why has he done this? Because he loves you so much. So whatever difficult circumstances before you, whatever failures you make along the way, as, as a- Abraham did, he failed so many times. Go and read his story. Stick with it. Continue believing the promises of God. Continue trusting in God. Because even the bad things that happen in your life will work together for good. I look at the bad things that have happened in my life a quarter of a century ago. And, and God has used those things to put me here now to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. I want to finish this series off talking about the love of God because the love of God is something that trumps everything in our lives. The love of God is what what leads us forward into this new resurrection life that God has for us. Just let's spend this time, these few minutes we have left in God's word, in, in one of the most powerful passages in the whole Bible. Some theologians call this the Himalayas of the New Testament. Come with me, Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What then are we to say about all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, who can be against you? He did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. Will he not also with him give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Because it's God who justifies. Who who is going to condemn you? It's Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. See what Paul's saying here is, he's writing this now about the love of God, but he's going through such trials, such afflictions, such persecution and beatings and imprisonments. We think those bad things come along and, and somehow they nullify the grace of God. Somehow they wipe out the forgiveness that we have in the cross. Somehow everything is blown. Everything works together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus and who are called according to his purposes. And even here, though Paul is being persecuted, he's still able to write about this powerful love of God. Now in all of these things, he says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Get rid of that victim mentality. Yes, you've sinned, so have I. God's forgiven us. We are justified. We have a right standing before God. The Spirit of God dwells in us. Yes, we have struggle. Yes, we have affliction. Yes, we have persecutions. No, in all of these things, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor depth, nor height, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, you are forgiven if you believe in Jesus. You are filled with his Holy Spirit if you believe in Jesus. And through every sin and every temptation, every time you stumble, you need not feel condemned because you are in Christ Jesus. Go to him. Keep short accounts with God. Ask for his forgiveness. For nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing. No trial, no temptation, no test can ever nullify the work of God in your life. He brought you to this place for a reason. Because he means to pour his love into you, his grace into you, his mercy into you, so much so, that they will overflow from your life as a flood tide of blessing into the lives of the parched, dry people who are around you. Father, I pray for each one of us today. Lord, thank you for your extravagant grace. Lord, I pray that you would pour your extravagant grace out on us more and more and more. Lord, bless us. Bless us indeed, Father God. And may your grace work through us in the lives of other people so that when we come to the end of this life, when we stand before you, we will hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
may you be so blessed as you receive the extravagant grace of God in your life. And never, never, ever forget, Jesus died and rose again for you. He died so that your sins may be forgiven. He rose again so that you may live a new life, a resurrection life for his glory. Well, that's pretty much all we have time for today. But before we go, I'd like to remind you about our life application booklet called, not surprisingly, Extravagant Grace. And the reason we call it a life application booklet is that it not only builds on the teaching that you've received in this series, but at the end of each chapter, there are some life application questions to help you think through and and apply God's Word right into your life. You can request your free copy of this e-booklet right now at our website, ChristianityWorks.com. You'll see that free offer toward the top of the homepage. Click on it, pop in your name and email, and it'll be winging its way to your inbox in just seconds. Again, the name of that e-booklet is Extravagant Grace. I'm Bernie Diamond. You've been watching Christianity Works, and I'll catch you again same time next week with another message of God's love, God's grace, and God's power for each one of us in Jesus Christ.